I was driving alone from eastern Colorado to Wyoming in the middle of the night on a dirt road. It was the type of darkness that most people never get to experience. Like being in the middle of the ocean. No cities or even small towns for hundreds of miles in every direction. Once I hit the border of Wyoming, the road became pavement. After about half an hour, I hear this loud bang and my car pulls hard to the middle of the road. I had a flat tire. I pull over and get out, and it's as quiet as can be. So dark, not a single light of any kind for hundreds of miles, except for my headlights. I start changing the tire by myself, feeling really uneasy about being alone in the middle of nowhere. So I get the tools and the spare tire out of the trunk and start changing the flat as fast as I can. For some reason I'm trying to be quiet because it feels like every little sound I make is incredibly loud. I even turn my music off. I'm crouched down finishing up, tightening the lug nuts on the spare, when I hear from right behind me. Need any help with that? I spin around and stand up fast, and no one is there. I look across the street in the other lane, and there's no one. I grab the tire iron and start yelling, Who's there? Who is out there? Dead silence. I mean, I could hear my heart beating. I could barely see the other side of the road because of the darkness, but I knew that there was nothing anywhere around me but dirt and sagebrush. I crank them tight, spin the jack down, the whole time I have that feeling someone is right behind me. I throw all the tools in the trunk with the flat and could not jump back in my car fast enough. I felt like someone was going to stop me from closing the door when I slammed it shut. I sped home to Wyoming, freaked out the whole time, checking my back seat over and over again. When I was younger, my family and I went on a road trip to Wyoming to see Yellowstone National Park. It's a beautiful place, and if you haven't seen it yet, I would recommend it. So from our home in California, it was about a 17-hour drive in our Yukon XL, which is the largest, most comfortable road trip SUV you can imagine. It took us several days worth of on and off driving to get there, and during the nights, we would try to find a little motel to rest at. One of the nights, due to us being behind schedule, my dad attempted to drive through the night to get us there sooner. He made it probably into the wee hours of the night before he deemed it unsafe and parked us in this little unlit rest stop in the middle of the woods in some flyover state. My brothers and I had fallen asleep in the car several hours before he had stopped, so for at least a couple hours we were all sleeping in the car in this dark little parking lot surrounded by forest. Having got a couple hours of sleep and being in a pretty uncomfortable position, I woke up in the middle of the night, pretty disoriented, but not really scared. I looked around and saw everyone fast asleep in this pitch black car, and I naturally felt pretty alone. I tried to fall back asleep, but it's just not working out, so I just sit there for a while, boredom setting in. Looking out the window to see where we were, it's pitch black, so I couldn't see anything. Luckily, I wasn't the type to pack light and had brought a couple flashlights in my bag. Being careful not to disturb my sleeping family, I reached into the back seat, unzipped my bag, and pulled out a little plastic yellow flashlight. It wasn't the brightest, but it was enough to see the foreground of the general surroundings. I put it up to the glass, making sure not to make any noise and pushed the little switch into the on position. I pressed my face against the glass and looked out. At first it looked like a normal tree line with some bushes, trees, and whatever, but as I scanned the darkness looking for animals, buildings, etc., I noticed this dark shape standing between these two trees in the distance. It looked like the shape of a man, but it wasn't moving. It was just standing there. After watching it for a good while and seeing no real signs of movement, I just assumed it was a bush of some kind or some natural occurrence. 
Just as I was about to turn the light off and re-attempt sleep, I saw this shadow shape turn 90 degrees and move behind a tree, disappearing from sight. This scared the hell out of me, and I immediately turned off the flashlight and threw my sweater turned blanket over my head, shutting my eyes tightly and covering my ears. I was paralyzed with fear. I sat in this semi-fetal position, clutching my flashlight for the rest of the night. I waited until the sun came up and we were back on the road before I got any sleep. I didn't tell anyone about the man that I saw in the woods. I grew up in the South in the late 70s and early 80s. My grandmother lived on a cotton farm in South Carolina, and my cousin and I would go visit her during the summer. We would help out around the farm, but during the heat of the day, we would go swimming in the river to cool off. Our favorite spot was fairly isolated, so we never really saw anyone else. But there was an old dirt road that ran from the gravel road back to an abandoned farmhouse in the woods. My cousin and I were in the river when we saw a cloud of dust in the distance. We thought maybe our uncle was coming to take us back to the farm, but we always swam for an hour or so after lunch, and he never drove the tractor to come get us. We had heard stories about some backwoods family who had gone all deliverance on some kids a few summers ago, but we figured it had to be just our uncle trying to freak us out. Regardless, we snuck up to the river bank so we could see the dirt road, but we would still be hidden in the trees. We saw a ratty Oldsmobile Delta 88 with blacked out windows creeping down the dirt road. The car didn't belong to anyone we knew. I only remember the make and model because I knew it was the evil dead car and because of what happened next. After it passed by our hiding spot, we noticed it didn't have a license plate. It drove another 30 yards or so and then stopped. A black garbage bag flew out of the passenger window and into the field. Then, the car made a slow and methodical three-point turn, taking great pains not to let the tires venture too far into the cotton field. It made its way back the direction it came until it disappeared out of sight. My cousin and I had remained silent throughout this event, and with the car gone, we looked at each other. I really wish we would have just ignored it. I wish we would have headed back to the farm. I wish we would have told our uncle or our grandmother what we had seen and had them come investigate. But we were only 13. Curiosity was killing us. We had to go check out that bag. As we left our hiding place and headed down the road, we looked around nervously, hoping the car wouldn't show up again. As we got close to the drop zone, we could see blood on some of the cotton directly above the bag's resting place. We could see blood all over the bag. We looked at each other one last time, and then we ran away. Over the years, I have thought a lot about what was inside that bag. A part of me is glad I don't know, but my curiosity will never go away. It has haunted me ever since. This happened just a couple weeks ago on a Friday. I had two friends in my car. We were coming back from a restaurant to celebrate finishing up the school play. I just dropped the first friend off and was now making the four or five mile drive to my second friend's house. It's a narrow road that cuts through some pretty dense woods. She was in the front seat and we were listening to ballads, just talking about life. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was driving behind a deep red pickup truck that had a motorcycle in the bed. I wasn't tailgating them, even though the driver was going a bit slow for my taste and swerving around just a tad too much. I was about to reach this intersection that's not even a block from my second friend's house when this guy pulls over. Seemingly for no reason, he just pulled over to the side of the road about a car or two length from the blinking red light. As I pass him to stop up ahead, I see his face. He has a pretty generic face, nothing unusual, but he's staring right at us with anger in his eyes. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I just sense something is not right. 
My friend looks out the window and says, What is he doing? I look at my rear view mirror to see the guy getting out of his seat, pulling a ski mask over his face and wielding a huge, I'd say 10 inch knife in his hand. He started sprinting toward my car, almost reaching the passenger side. I screamed and slammed on the gas, driving around for a while. The man only chased my car for a few blocks until he knew he wasn't going to catch us. When I got back at the intersection minutes later to drop my friend off, he was gone. My friend ran inside, locked her doors, and I sped away. But it was terrifying. I told the police and filled out a report last week. I'm never crossing that intersection again. My parents were out one night, and my brother and I were home alone. We were probably 12 and 10 years old at the time. There was a knock at the front door, and I hear a voice say, Pizza. Initially thinking it was my father playing a joke, I instinctively went to open the door. When it hit me, that wasn't my dad's voice. We didn't order any pizza, I said out loud. There was no reply, and no audible movement. I went to my bathroom window which allows some vision of the footpath leading from the front of our property to the front door, but you can't see the door itself. So we waited for about 15 minutes clutching a baseball bat and some ornamental fireplace poker until finally the guy moved away from the door and walked away. It was just some guy with dark hair and a ponytail, a long dark coat, and no pizza. One night when I was about seven years old, I went to sleep at around 9.30 and got into the second level of my bunk bed. I soon fell asleep, and then I woke up in the middle of the night to someone whispering, No! No! Repeatedly, as if they were in pain. Thinking I had just imagined it, I tried to go back to sleep, and that's when I heard the creaking of the wooden boards on the stairs, slowly getting louder and that whisper, no, no. I knew it wasn't my parents because they were sleeping in the bed next to mine. Then I heard some screaming along with the footsteps coming up the stairs and again the whisper, no, no. I slowly got out of bed, crept toward the ladder to get to the floor, and I slowly began to crawl towards the bedroom door in the dark, which had a full view of the stairs and I saw nothing moving in the dark nook of the stairs, but I now heard the whisper, no, no, coming from the room upstairs which nobody used. I silently crept toward the stairs, but I kept the lights off, and I began to creep down them so I could check the front door. Nothing was out of place, so I turned on the living room lights and that's when I saw it for an instance, the silhouettes of three people outside the living room window, and then they were gone. I proceeded to turn on every light in the house and then crawled into bed with my parents as I waited for it to be morning. A few years ago while I was driving home from my night shift security job, it was about 6.20 a.m. during the summer, so it wasn't completely dark out. I was coming around a small curve in the highway, and I saw something. It looked like a naked human being, walking on all fours, in a very strange way. It was moving slow across the road, with its head swaying back and forth as it crawled across the road right in front of me. I was too confused to be scared, so I just continued on home. A day or two later, I was talking to my parents who live about two miles from where I had seen the thing, and told them about it. They told me that some years ago two of their friends were walking in that area and both came running to their house scared to death and would never tell anyone what happened or what they had seen. Later while telling scary stories with my friends, I told them of the thing I had seen that night 
One of my friends who was a cop said about eight years ago a man was run over at that curve and everyone in the community thought he was a skinwalker. It doesn't scare me. I still drive on that same road all the time, day and night, but I still look for it every time I drive by that curve. One night, three years ago, I got into a fight with my girlfriend at the time. In my rage, I stormed out of her house, got in my truck, and just drove. I hopped on the interstate. About an hour later, I was in Nashville, but I was still pissed, so I decided to keep driving. I made it my goal to reach Kentucky and turn around. I had never been to Kentucky before, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. I reached Kentucky about 2.30 in the morning, having left my town a little after 12.30. I grabbed a Coke and a biscuit from the first McDonald's and headed back to Alabama. As I'm heading back, I realize I'm running low on gas right as I get to Nashville. So I pull off Interstate 65, go down the off-ramp, and hit a light. I make a left and hit another light. Now here's where things get really weird. As I pull up to this light, I notice something strange. The only car on the road is stopped at the green light to the right. Weird, I thought. But hey, it is after 3 a.m. Maybe the person is just really tired. Once I reach the light, the car rolls forward through the light and under the overpass for the interstate. Then I see their brakes light up and their headlights go out. They stopped under the overpass and my heart starts to race. I was sitting in the turn lane waiting for the light. The gas station was right past the overpass, and there they were, waiting for me. I was freaking out. I watched my light turn green, and then back to red. I was waiting to see if they would move, but they didn't. Finally, when the light switched to green again, I flicked on my high beams and crept through the intersection, trying to make out their faces, but I couldn't. Then lo and behold, as soon as I passed them, their headlights turned on, and they started moving again. At this point I'm scared, staring at the headlights in my rear view instead of the road as I make it a couple hundred feet to the gas station. Thankfully when I pull in the gas station the first thing I notice is the cop car parked out front. So I park at the pump and as I'm getting out of my car I watch the car pull into the station. I start pumping gas and as I'm doing so I watch a man exit the vehicle and start to walk inside. The whole time from the second his head pops out of the car to when he makes it inside the store, he is staring at me, smiling crazily, shaking his head left to right. He walks into the store and gets in line right behind the cop. Now maybe I've watched too many movies, but the whole time he was standing there, I thought he was going to kill that cop. Thankfully, he did not. Once I had enough gas to get home, I stopped pumping, jumped in my car, and double checked my phone for directions back to the interstate. As I was leaving the gas station though, I noticed the man leave his place in line and run out of the store. That's when I panicked. I hit the gas, ran the red light at the overpass, ran another red light, and got back on the interstate, and then went about 85 to 90 miles per hour the whole way home, constantly checking my rear view. Still one of the creepiest things to ever happen to me and it reiterated to me what the detective told all the incoming freshmen at orientation. Nothing good happens after 2 a.m. I'm a journalist, and I was told this story by a woman that I interviewed for true crime. When this woman was a young girl, say eight years old, she started to come downstairs at night to tell her father that there was a man in her closet. He tells her that there's no such thing as the boogeyman and sends her back to bed. This happens on and off for like a week. Finally, he gets frustrated and walks her back to the room and says, look, I'll show you, there's nothing in your closet, and goes to open the door. It opens an inch, and then he feels someone slam it shut. Turns out there really was a man in her closet. 
This guy was a pervert who would come into the house every night and stare at the girl from the closet while she slept. The dad kicked the hell out of him, and the pervert went to prison for many years. I researched her story 20 years after this happened. The guy had just gotten out of jail, and no one knew where he was. I was driving along this road that stretches out over about 100 kilometers. It was about 1 a.m., and I was at the end of the road that is very desolate. Neighbors were kilometers apart from each other. It's a familiar route for me. I drive on it once every few months just to go anywhere. Because of how isolated it is, there's no street lights, so you have to rely on your car headlights. On this particular night, I was feeling a little strange because the route didn't seem familiar, which is impossible because it's just one long road with the occasional turning roads. But I kept driving along towards the place where I turn around. I can to this certain point in the road where there was one lone house. Their car was parked in the driveway, and I could see that there was someone in the passenger seat. I thought it was weird because it was so late at night. As I got closer to them, they turned the car on and flashed their high beam lights at me. I didn't pay much attention to this, but then I drove past them and looked into my rear view mirror to see what they were up to. They pulled out of their driveway onto the road going the same direction I was. I was a little nervous at this point because it still looked unfamiliar to me. About five minutes up the road, I looked into my rear view mirror again and the car that pulled out behind me was gone. I looked to my left and noticed an abandoned convenience store on the side of the road. This was something I remember driving past whenever I would drive up here, and I remember that directly in front of the store, a couple of feet away, there's a phone booth. Both the store and the phone booth were run down and covered in graffiti. Neither had been used in a very long time. As I got closer, I saw that there was a dark figure behind the glass of the phone booth. They were looking right at me. I could see their eyes in my headlights. I got a little closer and they stepped out of the phone booth and started walking toward the road that I was on. I started to speed up and then this really bright light came on behind me and this person just took off toward the back of the store. I looked in my rearview mirror once more and saw the car that had flashed me earlier. It was about 100 meters behind me. It followed me for another kilometer or so until we reached a turn off-road where it made a U-turn and went back the other way. To get home, I had to go back the way I came. I drove past the phone booth and there was no one there. And then I reached the house where the car had pulled out and it was back in its driveway. The driver still in the front seat. This happened to me when I was a little kid, but no one was ever found in my basement. It was my first time staying home alone while my whole family was out at my brother's ball game. I was 13, I think. I'm on the phone with a friend of mine feeling so grown up when someone beeps in on the other line. I tell her that I'll be right back and click over. Then, the creepiest voice I have ever heard says, Hello, little girl. I'm the man in your basement. Honestly, I laughed it off and just hung up thinking it was a prank call. I was pretty confident at my age, and my neighborhood was pretty safe, so I figured someone was just messing with me, knowing it was my first time home alone. They beeped in again, and so I clicked over and heard, Don't hang up on me again. And the lights started flickering, and there was a banging under my feet. Our basement was actually just an area connected to the garage. I heard what sounded like footsteps coming up the garage steps to get into our kitchen. I kept trying to hang up and call the cops, but every time I tried, he was still on the phone. My friend told her parents what was happening, and they ran to the neighbor's house to call the police for me. I sat petrified with a butcher knife behind my front door, because it was the only place in the house downstairs that couldn't be seen from a window. 
Eventually, I clicked over to hear a police dispatcher on the phone and stayed on the line with her until the police got to my house. There was no sign of forced entry, though we had a broken window pane on our outside garage door that had been messed up for months prior, and my guess is, that's how he got in. The police assumed I was just a paranoid girl, and they were going to leave me home alone again after they cleared the house. Fortunately, a family friend had been driving by and saw the cops there. They stopped to see if everything was okay. He gave me a ride to the school where my family was. They were skeptical that anything had happened, but we did get a security system not much longer after that, and my parents both got cell phones. This was 1994, I think, so cell phones weren't popular yet. After that happened, I swear there was someone stalking me for years. I would leave my apartment locked and bolted, and come back to find appliances on. I lived in four different places and would get strange phone calls sometimes. Cars would randomly be parked down the road from a house and speed up and slam on the brakes as I would run inside. I would hear loud bangs outside when I lived out in the country. Nothing has happened since I've been in my current house and married, but I'm still super paranoid all the time. I worked nights at a warehouse, often drove my motorcycle because it's fun and saves money on gas. I was coming home one night. There was a heavily wooded, bushed area right on the side of the road. I pull up to a stop sign and there is just some guy standing in the bushes. I come to a stop, look at him. We make eye contact and he starts walking toward me. I nearly killed my engine as I floored it the hell out of there. I got a mile or so down the road, pulled over, pulled out my handgun, and then called the police. I didn't see him again. The police went and checked out the area, supposedly, but there was no one there by the time they had arrived. The guy was really scary looking. When I was a teenager in Colorado Springs, we all used to crawl through this small tunnel that was directly under the interstate to get back and forth from our neighborhood without having to jump fences and run across the highway. One drunken night alone, I was on my way home about 2 or 3 a.m. I came out of the tunnel only to find myself face to face with this huge Rottweiler staring at me. I was in shock for a second. My stomach dropped. Instinctively, I started yelling at the dog to go home. He just stood there glaring at me, and every step I slowly took trying to get away, he would bark and growl, showing his teeth. So I started stomping toward him in a dominant way, yelling at him to go away. He turned and took steps back, but still proceeded in barking and growling. I stupidly, drunkenly started to power walk away. I then heard his feet running towards me as I had my back turned. He was right behind me when I turned around. I fell backwards, and when I looked up, he was gone, as if I had imagined the entire thing. To this day, I don't know if the dog was somebody's pet or what. I didn't hear him running away after I fell, so I will never know just what the hell happened. I lived in New Mexico for several years before moving to the Midwest. My friend Amy and I would spend many days exploring the remote corners of New Mexico, discovering abandoned ghost towns and enjoying the quiet, desolate beauty of the desert. One afternoon in March 2010, we were traveling to Albuquerque. Always up for exploring, we took a back road rather than traveling the more direct highway. One leg of our journey had us on NM-55. It's a remote, teeny tiny two-lane highway. We loved those types of roads, up until this day. This part of New Mexico is flat and desolate desert. You can see for miles, and there is virtually nothing except dirt and rock between towns. 
and towns can be miles apart. So we were on NM55 going north. We saw a white pickup truck ahead of us going the same direction. Suddenly, he stopped his truck sideways in the middle of the highway, blocking both lanes. We were about a mile away from him, and as we got closer, we began to feel uneasy. We could see no reason for him to do this. We were the only other vehicle out there, and we began wondering if we should turn around rather than come up to him and have to stop. We were about a half a mile away from him when he pulled over to the opposite side of the highway, but his truck was still pointed the direction we were going. We tried to relax a little. Surely this guy was a rancher or something. Maybe he was checking something on his land. As we passed him, we noticed a few things. One, there was only one person in the truck, a middle-aged guy who never took his eyes off of us. And two, he was talking into a walkie-talkie. A few seconds after we passed him, he pulled back onto the highway and started following us, but he never got too close. He would get within a car length away, and then drop back a little, and then speed back up again to a car length away. We were getting nervous. We realized how alone we really were. We had seen no other traffic on that road, and we hadn't told anyone about our great idea to take this detour. We checked our cell phones and neither of us had a signal. Typical for remote New Mexico, but scary given our present situation. Amy was driving and speeding up while I frantically checked the map, hoping to find a road that would have more traffic. There was no other road. We had to travel this one to get to the next town, which was Mountain Air. Turning around to go back the other way didn't seem like a good option either. After a few minutes, we saw another pickup truck coming towards us. He was going very, very slowly. Maybe 20 miles per hour, if that. This pickup truck was old and beat up, whereas the one behind us was new. Amy had us up to 75 miles per hour, which wasn't typical for us on these 55 mile per hour highways, and we blew by the old pickup. As we passed it, we saw that it was another middle-aged guy, and he was also talking into a walkie-talkie. After the white pickup passed him, he pulled a U-turn and pulled in behind it. As we watched all of this, we could see the guy in the white pickup truck talking into his walkie-talkie. No doubt these two knew each other. We were being deliberately followed, and for the first and only time in my life, I felt like my life was in danger. They stayed right behind us. We watched for obstacles in the road. We truly thought old beat-up pickup guy had set up a trap in the road and our vehicle would be disabled somehow. We talked about driving into the fields. We were in an SUV, but this was very obviously their territory, and we were afraid of what would happen if we went off-road and got cornered. So we stayed on the highway. By now, the white pickup truck guy was right on top of us. We could see him talking into the walkie-talkie, and he stayed right on our bumper. The old beat-up truck guy was right on top of him. The three of us sped down the highway. The guy in the white truck inched closer and closer. His maneuvering and edging made it apparent that he was trying to bump us. I watched helplessly as he got to within inches of our back bumper. Amy floored it. We were passing 80 miles per hour and edging up to 90. The road was flat and deserted, but any little thing going wrong would have been catastrophic. We absolutely were not going to slow down or stop if we could help it. The white pickup truck pulled into the opposite lane and started to gain speed. The only thing we could think of was that he wanted to pass us and get in front of us. If he got in front of us and his buddy was behind us, then we would be boxed in and trapped. We looked frantically at the rocky desert on both sides of us. Our only option was to off-road it. Should we risk it? Could we speed through the desert and make it to safety in one piece? As we topped a small incline, we saw a sign that said, Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument, and it pointed toward a road on the left. And right at that moment, a blue pickup truck pulled out of that road and onto the highway in front of us. As we came up on the blue pickup, we saw the plate said, 
U.S. Park Service. We looked at each other and then looked behind us. Both pickup trucks did U-turns and went the opposite way. We followed the blue pickup truck to Mountain Air and then made our way to Albuquerque. I don't know exactly what those guys' intentions were, but they weren't good. There is something seriously wrong out there. I notified the state police and they said they would keep an eye on things. This area is very near Belen, New Mexico, which is where Terra Calico was abducted. Whoever abducted Terra has never been caught. Maybe we came into meth lab territory, but since this happened on an actual highway rather than a backcountry road, I tend to discount the meth lab theory. Whatever is going on out there, it's not good. About 15 years ago, my mom and cousin were coming home from visiting my aunt, who lived two hours away. The drive takes you through the desert and up some mountains, but there is a shortcut you can take to avoid the mountains and shave about 10 minutes off your drive time. The only problem is, the shortcut takes you literally through the middle of nowhere. It's a two-lane road with nothing for 30 miles. No houses, no shops, no lights. Not even those roadside emergency phone booths. They're driving along through the shortcut at about 11 p.m. when they spot something on the road. At first, my cousin thinks it's a rock, so she slows down to go around it. When she gets closer, she realizes it's a lady with long black hair and what looks like a burlap shawl wrapped around her. She's crouched down facing away from my cousin. My mom says that she thought the lady might have been in trouble, so they pull up next to her and ask if she's okay and if she needs help. My cousin says that the lady stood up, looked at them, and then let out a shriek like a banshee. She insists that her eyes were pitch black and her skin was as white as a sheet and she was really skinny, like anorexic skinny. I debate this because it was dark out and her mind might have been playing tricks on her, but nonetheless it was enough to spook the hell out of her and make her punch the accelerator and get out of there. The lady briefly ran after them, but they lost sight of her after a short while. They didn't stop for anything, even running a stop sign, until they got to the next town where they stopped at a gas station to get something to drink and to collect their thoughts. A few weeks later, my cousin was telling her co-worker what happened, and she said that it might have been a skinwalker, and that she's very lucky that she got away. That spooked her even worse, so now she won't go through the shortcut, even when someone else is driving. She insists on them taking the main highway. I worked for McDonald's for my first job in 2017. The McDonald's I worked at was in a very rural part of town, and at the time, the McDonald's was open for 24 hours. When I worked there, I had a boss that was a huge jerk and made me work the night shift. I really didn't want to, but at the time, I really needed the money and I wasn't in the position to not be working, so therefore, I really had no choice. I took the night shift, figuring that it wouldn't be that bad. I wasn't the only one working the night shift, though. I had a few other workers with me, but they mostly made the food or took the customer's order at the drive-thru. I was the one at the register taking people's orders. Anyway, one day I was told that I would be working from 8pm to 1am. So I worked for the first few hours and normally after around 10pm people started coming less and ordering less. It was around 15 minutes before my shift finally ended and the other workers had already left. I was starting to get ready to leave, but I got a text from the other person who was supposed to work when I left that he was on his way, but he may be a bit late. So that meant I had to wait even longer. I was on my phone looking on Snapchat when someone pulled up in a blue truck into the McDonald's parking lot. It was an older guy, maybe around 30. 
He walked up to the counter and I politely asked if I could take his order. He said, oh, uh, could I just get a value fry and a water? I told him sure thing, and I told him his total was 105. He then reached into his pocket and pulled out a $50 bill and then putting his hand out as if he wanted me to have it. I was a bit confused as to why he would give me $50, so I told him, oh, it's alright, it's only a dollar, you don't need to give me a 50. He then said, oh, don't worry, you could keep the change. I told him that we didn't accept bills over $20. As soon as I told him that, his smile faded into a frown. I could also tell that he seemed to be getting quite angry. I asked if he was okay, and he told me in a very, very angry voice to shut up or else he would cut me while leaning towards me. I could now see that he was holding something in his pocket. I didn't know what it was, but when he said the word cut, I figured that he had a knife. I'm a 5 foot 7 girl and this guy was around 6 foot 3 so there was no way I could fight him even if I tried. I was very uncomfortable at this point and wanted to leave and thank god I saw the headlights approaching from the McDonald's. It was the guy working after me and once the man saw him he walked out of the door. I told the person working after me what happened and he offered to call the cops but I stupidly said no. Unfortunately it doesn't end there. I had left work and I was in my car driving home when I saw a pair of headlights from behind me. It seemed as if they were following me. I wanted to know for sure if they were, so I purposely made a few turns and they did too. It was confirmed that they were indeed following me. Thankfully I knew the area I was in very well and I knew there was a police station not too far away from where I was. I drove to the police station and pulled in and got out of my car. The vehicle that was following me slowly passed by the police station and kept on driving. However, I realized that the vehicle was the exact same blue truck that the man was driving. The reason why he stopped following me and kept going was because I had parked in the police station and he didn't want to get caught. I waited about 10 minutes and drove home making sure that no one was following me. The next day I called my job and told them I quit. I will never do another night shift again. This took place in the middle of July. It was hurricane season, which meant almost every day it would rain like crazy. I liked the rain for most of the time. I found it relaxing and calm. One day, I had the day off from work and I honestly needed a break because work was honestly very stressful at the time. I work as a store manager and I would have to deal with angry customers and answer calls all day and believe it or not, after a while it gets very stressful. Anyway, it was around 7pm and I was lying down watching some show on my TV when I heard a tap coming from my window. My bedroom is a master bedroom, and the back of my bed faces the window, so I heard it loud and clear. The curtains were closed, and I was curious as to who or what was outside hitting my window. I gathered up the courage to open the curtain and look outside, but there was nothing there. It was dark and was raining heavily, so I brushed it off, thinking that it might have been a twig or a branch. But my fears were confirmed when I heard a door shut from upstairs and then heard footsteps. I immediately grabbed my gun from under my bed and hid in the closet. I then heard footsteps coming down the stairs. I didn't live alone, I lived with my wife, but my wife was in New York for her high school reunion so whoever was in my house couldn't have been her. I then heard footsteps coming down the hall along with two doors opening and closing. Then, the footsteps came to my bedroom. I could see the man through the cracks of the closet. He was very tall, maybe about 6 foot 5, and was wearing all black. He looked under the bed and then in the bathroom. He was now walking over to the closet. I quickly put some clothes on top of myself to not be seen. He opened the closet door with force and waited a few seconds before closing it. There was complete silence in the room now. I almost thought that maybe the man had left. I quietly removed the clothes off me and slowly started making my way towards my bed to get my phone and call the cops. 
However, I then felt something grab my foot from under my bed and start pulling it. I then felt something extremely sharp go into my foot. I looked down and it was the man. I shot him in the arm and he screamed in pain while getting up and running out the front door. I still called the cops but they unfortunately never found him. I still don't know how he managed to break in my house as we did have an alarm system throughout the house. I really hope I never see that man again. Alright, so this occurred when I was 16 and because of what happened I will never use social media again. It was getting near the end of the school year which meant that we would have the summer off in a couple of weeks. It also meant that teachers would let the class have free time and rarely give out assignments. Anyway, I was in class sitting with my friends chatting as our teacher did give us free time. We were pretty much talking about all the things girls in high school would talk about. What we were doing over the summer, college, jobs, a car, and even graduation. As one of my friends was talking about how her boss just fired her from her job, I got a notification from Facebook on my phone. A username that I have never seen before sent me a friend request. Let me be as clear as I can. Getting friend requests from unknown users is no big surprise to me. What I would do is if I knew the person I would accept their request and request to be their friend as well, but if I didn't know who they were I would just accept the request or decline it. In this case I didn't know who this person was so I declined him. Just then, I received another notification on my phone from Facebook. It was the same username and he sent me a direct message. It read something along the lines of, Hey, you're really pretty, would you like to chat? I responded telling him that I didn't know who he was and apologized. Keep in mind, this guy looked to be about 40 and I was 18 at the time so this was starting to become very creepy. My friends eventually wanted to see what I was up to and so I showed them the chat. Two of my friends really didn't care and the others said to just block him. I felt like blocking him wouldn't be the right thing to do at the time so I just left it alone. When I got home, I received another notification on my phone from the same guy. He said that we will get to know each other and that we would start a quote romantic relationship. I was beyond creeped out at this point and so I blocked him and thought it was over. I'd say not even 10 minutes later, I received another message from Facebook but with a different username. It read, Why did you block me? I want to get to know you. I told him to leave me alone and that he was way too older than me and that if he didn't stop that I would call the police and report him. He then started using profanity and making threats and that he was going to find me and kill me. I blocked him once again and called the cops, but of course they couldn't do anything since he really didn't commit a crime. I find that BS, but whatever. His account was also taken down and even if the police could track him, I couldn't remember his username. About a week or so went by and I was starting to forget about what happened. I just wanted to graduate high school and be done. But a few days later, I was home alone in my room on my computer when I heard my dogs barking at something. I went to go see what they were barking at. They were barking at something outside of the sliding glass door, but I couldn't see anything since it was dark out there. I looked a bit harder, and I could see someone standing in our yard, looking straight at me. He then took off running, and I never saw him again. I have no idea if whoever that was was the person on Facebook, but I believe that it might have been. When I was about 22 years old, I attended a university over 2,000 miles away from my home. I was ready to start a new chapter of my life by studying culinary in college as I wanted to be a chef as a career. I didn't have the money with me at the time to pay for my college, so I had to get a student loan and pay back the money. That meant that I had to get a job while I was in college. All of the jobs that I tried looking for either rejected my application or weren't hiring. My university did have jobs on campus, but from what I heard was that you don't get paid much. 
However, it didn't really seem like I had a choice, so I decided to work on campus. I, for some reason, chose to be a library assistant. Basically, I would scan books and put them where they belong. It was an easy task, but a long one. Anyway, one day, the library was empty as it was getting ready to close. I was finishing up putting a few books away on the shelves when I heard the library doors open and then close. I just figured that it was a student coming to return a book or something. I turned around to see not a student, but some guy. He didn't even look like a student, he looked homeless. I told him that we were closed and to come back tomorrow, but he didn't respond to what I told him. He just stood there looking at me. I could now see that he was high on something. This man wasn't right and so I asked if he needed help. He finally then responded saying no in a raspy voice. I knew there was something wrong with him and so I called the security. But before I was able to put the phone to my ear, he grabbed me with one of his arms and used his other arm to take out something from his pocket. I started to freak out and started trying to break free but his arm was holding onto my arm really, really tight. He then gave me the creepiest smile I have ever seen while still holding the knife up. I started screaming and thank god there was security nearby. They stormed into the library and pushed the man to the ground and called the police. When the police arrived, I was questioned and they took the man off to some mental institution. It's been three years since that happened and I just hope he's getting the help he needs. But this was the scariest experience I've ever had. This happened a few years ago, six years to be exact. I was around 10 years old at the time, and my dad and my younger brother who was seven all decided to go up to our cabin in Colorado. My parents had built this cabin long before I was born when they lived in Colorado. It was a nice small log cabin. It had a kitchen, a small living room, a bathroom, and two bedrooms. When we got to our cabin, we unpacked everything. We didn't pack much as we were only staying for a few nights. When we unpacked, I went to the room I would be staying in, and in the room I was staying in had the only window that had a clear view to the forest. My brother would be sleeping with my dad since he was still at the age where he was scared of the dark or being alone. My dad and brother were going to pick up dinner and would be back in about an hour as the cabin was in a rural area and the nearest pizza shop was about 15 miles away. I didn't really have anything to do other than to just sit around. It was so boring that I regret going on this trip. Yes, there was a TV, but it wasn't working and on top of that there were no movies or TV shows. I also couldn't talk to anyone on the phone because I had no service. I eventually took a short nap and was awoke to a noise. I woke up wondering what it was. It sounded like something or someone was scratching their nails against metal. I looked out my window, but I didn't see anything. Just in case someone was out there, I put the blinds down, but they would only go down halfway. I put some clothes in the remaining space between the blinds. When I was walking through the hallway to enter the living room, I stopped. Standing in the living room was a man who was very tall, maybe about 6'4". He didn't see me as he was facing the opposite direction. I have no idea how he got in, but that didn't matter at the moment. I quietly stepped back into the hallway and went back into my room which had the only working lock. I shut the door quietly and locked it. I was in my room for a good five minutes when I heard footsteps coming towards my bedroom door. I started to panic trying to find something to use as a weapon. I found an airsoft gun that was painted all black. It was a fake gun but it still looked convincing to scare someone off. I had it in my hand, and then he started banging on the door very hard. After the fifth kick to the door, he had broken the door down. But when he saw what was in my hand, he made a run for it out the front door. I waited for my dad to get home so I could tell him what happened. He got home and called the cops, but nothing ever became of that man. He got away with it, and we never saw him again.
A few years ago, my group of friends and I were having a bonfire during the middle of the summer. July to be exact. We just started talking about random stuff that normal teenage guys would talk about. Eventually, one of my friends, we'll call him Jordan, decided that we should all tell a scary story. I honestly thought that it was a good idea, and our other friends agreed. Jordan went first. Jordan told a story about Bigfoot or something. One of my other friends, named Adam, told us a story that really gave us goosebumps. I can't remember every detail of the story, as Adam told us this story a long time ago. I'm not sure if the story was real or fake, but either way, it all gave us chills. Adam said that he was going to tell a story about how his dad came in contact with a ghost in a hotel. So here it goes. Adam's dad worked as the person who always sat in the front desk taking calls and giving visitors their keys to their rooms. I can't remember the name of the hotel, but it was very fancy. Adam's dad had just recently got the job and was told by the hotel janitor about a ghost of a woman named Sally that lived in the hotel. Adam's dad didn't believe in the paranormal, so he obviously thought it was BS. One day, he got a call at the front desk from the room 215. He answered the phone saying, Hello, front desk speaking, how may I assist you? There was no response. The person on the other end was silent. After saying hello for a few more times, he hung up. But not even a minute later, the phone rang again from room 215. He said hello again, and this time, he could hear someone's voice on the other end. It sounded like a woman's voice. She said something along the lines of, I need help. Before he could even respond, she hung up immediately. Adam's dad spoke with the manager of the hotel explaining the situation about the woman in room 215. The manager had this confused look on his face. The manager had said that no one had been checked into that room in weeks. Both of them went up to room 215. They opened the door and went inside the room, but they didn't find anyone there. In fact, everything was organized and looked as if no one checked in. The manager had just told him that maybe it was one of the hotel staff maybe pulling a prank or something. But after what Adam's dad was told about Sally, he was then convinced that what he was talking to over the phone was nothing more than a ghost. This story is told from the perspective of a female. A few years ago, when I was 13 years old, I attended a summer camp that I loved very much. I would go there every summer to make new friends and to see the old ones too. But after my last experience at summer camp, I will never be going again. It was a Tuesday, I believe, and we'd just gotten done eating our lunch. After lunch, the group had a choice of either going swimming or fishing. The camp did have a small lake where you could fish in, and I myself have never been fishing, so I figured that I would give it a try. It was just me and a few other kids. As the instructor was teaching us how to put the hook on the line, I saw a man emerge from the tree line from the other side of the lake. I thought nothing of it and continued to focus on trying to get a good catch, but I felt his eyes looking in my direction. I eventually looked at him, and he was indeed staring at me. Let me give you a description of him. He had a blue jacket, sweatpants, and was wearing sandals along with a hat. I didn't know who this person was, and I went over to the instructor to tell him about the man, but of course, when I told him about the man, he was gone. I continued fishing for about another hour before it was time for the group to go back inside the gym for sports. At one point, I had to use the restroom, so I started making my way over to the woman's restroom and stepped inside, but I then heard a man's voice say, hello again. But before I was about to say something back, the same man from earlier stepped out from one of the stalls and looked right at me. I saw craze in his red eyes and was disgusted by the smell of marijuana on him. He then said to me, come with me, I want you to see something. I walked over to the door to exit the restroom, but he then blocked me from leaving. He grabbed me by the arm and then said, If you scream, I will kill you. Do you understand? 
I nodded my head, telling him that I understood. My dad had told me to keep calm and what to do if I ever came across a situation like this. And that's exactly what I did. I kept calm and did what the man asked. As he was walking out with me while holding my arm, I heard a deep voice yell from behind us. Thank God it was a police officer. I then began screaming and kicking, trying to fight for my life. And after a few seconds, the man let go and ran to his car, along with the police officer chasing him. The officer escorted me to the gym where the group was and explained what happened to the counselor and staff. My mom picked me up early that day, and I never went back to summer camp again. My advice is to please be careful, because there are dangerous people out there, and you will never know what they might do to you if they catch you. A few years ago, I went on a camping trip with the scouts for a week. I've always been a camping slash outdoors person and that's really the main reason why I joined the scouts in the first place. We were going to a place called Camp Bonin in North Carolina. We lived in Florida, so we would be taking a long bus trip to North Carolina. We left on Friday and got there Sunday evening. Once we got there, our scoutmaster told us to unpack everything and to get our tent set up quickly as we only had a good hour of daylight. Anyway, within about 45 minutes, we had been set up and started cooking our meals. My friend, we'll call him Eric, who was also in the scouts, who I'm still friends with till this day, told us we should go and explore in the woods. Now, I wasn't exactly sure if the scouts were allowed to go exploring into the woods, but our scoutmaster said earlier that you could go anywhere as long as you're with another scout. So, therefore, we figured that it would be okay. Anyway, we start making our way into the woods with our flashlights as it was getting dark. We walk for about 10 minutes when we come across a small little shed that had looked like it had been abandoned for the past 60 years. At this point, we weren't sure what to do. Eric had said that we should go in and look around. Me, on the other hand, knew that we were going to get into trouble who went inside, so I said no. Eric then went on and called me a wuss and said that I was always afraid of everything. I honestly didn't have time for his comments, so I sighed and said we could go in for a few minutes. The door was basically broken down, so we didn't have a problem getting inside. We got inside and turned on our flashlights. It was basically empty. There was some furniture, but that was basically pretty much it. However, Eric then said, What is that? He was shining his light on a rope hanging from the roof. It took me a few seconds before I realized that it was a noose. I told him to just leave it alone. As we were walking out, Eric tripped over something soft. We both shined our light to see what he had tripped on, and ran. We ran out of there fast and back down the trail to catch our breath. What we saw was the dead body of a woman. She looked like she had been dead for maybe about a week at most. We were talking about whether or not we should report it. We decided not to tell anyone since we would get in trouble. After that, we barely talked to anyone for the rest of the trip. The day we were packing up and leaving, Eric and I decided to go see if anything had happened at the shed. And surprisingly, something did. All the furniture in the shed was gone, along with the body and the noose. Someone had known that we had been there. We left and reported it to our scoutmaster. We explained everything and he thank God believed us. Within 20 minutes they had police searching the shed, but I don't know what happened after that. Needless to say, we still got in trouble, but that was expected. About a week later, I was watching the news and saw that the police had found a man hiding in the same shed we found. He admitted to hanging and killing the woman who turned out to be his girlfriend. He was put in jail for life without parole. So, yeah, I don't think I'll be joining the scouts again. This happened when I was 15 years old. Every summer, my family and I would go up to New York to visit relatives. It was very fun overall, and my aunt and uncle would take me everywhere. Anyway, 
There would be some days I would sleep at my grandma's house, and then there would be other days that I would sleep at my aunt and uncle's house. This night, however, I was staying at my uncle's house as my grandma was out of town for a few days. My aunt and uncle had just recently had a baby, and she had her own room, so that meant I had to sleep downstairs in the living room. They didn't have an air mattress, so I had to sleep on the couch, which was extremely uncomfortable. The living room has a lot of windows, three behind the couch, and a huge window where you could see out into the woods. I was tossing and turning, trying to get a good position where I could get comfortable. After about ten minutes of rolling around, I finally got some sleep, but I was awoke to what sounded like a banging noise. I dismissed the noise as a dream, but then a second noise came. This time, I woke up looking around the room for the noise, and then I found it. Standing behind the big glass window was a man knocking on it. He was wearing a black hoodie, and in his free hand was a knife. However, it didn't seem like he noticed me. He wasn't looking in my direction. It was more like he was looking around the room to see if anyone was there. I knew that it was only a matter of seconds before he spotted me, and God only knows what he was planning on doing. I gathered up the courage to run upstairs into my uncle's room. I told him everything and he got his hunting rifle and went downstairs to show him that he was armed. The man was still there. But instead of running away, he started laughing and it wasn't normal. It was a low threatening laugh, as if he wasn't afraid of my uncle. Not even five seconds later, we heard a window from the other side of the house smash open. We then realized that it was more than one person. We bolted up the stairs and woke my aunt and the baby. We then heard a pair of footsteps coming up the stairs fast. We took that chance to climb out our window and fall on the ground. We didn't care what was in front of us, only what was behind. We booked it to the neighbor's house and called the police. And they investigated and told us that the house had been ruined inside and any values were stolen.